day, welcome to another segment of Learning Made Easy with the Rock Tutors. I know you've been learning so far with us. How have you learned with us? I hope you've been enjoying it so far. Today, we'll be discussing literature, specifically poetry. For those of you preparing for your WIKE and NECO examinations, please come on with me. Here on the board, we have the first question. Black woman is an example of negative poetry. Discuss. Now, first of all, let's talk about the poem, Black Woman, written by Leopold Seda Senga. Now, Leopold is one of the fighters, the freedom fighters of Africa. He fought for his nation and became the first president of his nation after they gained independence. He wrote this poem as a form of praise to praise all the women in Africa who have seen themselves as nothing and lesser, lesser humans than the white people. You know, during the period of apartheid, our women were sold as slaves. They were made to work and they were raped. So many children were born out of this relationship that the children could not associate themselves with either their father's family or their mother's family. So many things happened to our African women. And then he sat down to imagine how he would make these women feel that they are good. And then he came up with the poem, Black Woman, Naked Woman. Now, this poem beautifies everything Africa. The poem is in two phases. It talks about everything Africa and then a woman embodied in our own creation. You know, as a woman, first of all, God gave us love. And the kind of love we have in us is embodied in the way we take care of our children, even our neighbor's children. Despite the fact that our black women were being maltreated, they still care for these white people's children as if they were their own. Just imagine the kind of love God taught us. And then the poet talked about our beauty. He talked about our tenderness, how caring we are, and went about talking about the different things we have in our culture, the turtle, the, the, the drum that is played in a particular part in Senegal, and so much more. Now, when we talk about negritude, Leopold himself described negritude as a form of fighting against anything that is not African. Is it their culture? Their dressing? Anything that works against Africa as a culture itself. Now, looking at this poem, of course, we would agree that it is a negritude poem. Why? Because it describes the beauty and everything African. And how the fact that we ourselves, we are enough beauty. We don't need artificial things. We don't need these people to describe our own beauty. And then he came to describe the fact that it is not only when we are alive that we are beautiful, that even in death, we still have something to give out. He describes us like the soil, because when you plant in your loamy soil, it grows better than when you plant in your sandy soil. Of course, he now describes the black woman as the black soil that produces life and gives everything life connected with. That even in death, she still uses our roots to feed the roots of life. She uses our, our, our ashes to feed the roots of life. So you know that despite the fact that we are pained, we have gone through so many things from these nations who came to colonize us, but we still have beauty. And what is that beauty? Our own selves, our own color. Ends when um, the woman, that woman was singing, she said, Melanin popping, I'm black, I'm beautiful. I don't know about you. Now, I guess that answers the question. Black woman is an example of negritude poetry. Now, let's move on to the next one. Question two. Show how Africa suffered and survives still in the grieved lands of Africa. Oh, have you read that poem? The grieved lands of Africa. How did you feel? Augustineto tried with that poem. I like the end part where he said that Africa will still survive no matter what is happening to us. Now, the poem describes the trials of Africa during the period of colonialism and then slave trade. First of all, when these white people came, because they wanted to take or tap our resources, they came and they raided us and made, turned us to slaves, making us feel like we are lesser human beings, telling us 
that we are blacks and blacks came from monkeys i know some of you have heard that story right good but please ma blacks did not come from monkeys good so let's continue now it described the fact that those white people claim the blacks came from monkeys and then they took us from our own land from where we have been brought up with people that have dreams that have built their dreams and ideologies and then we were taken on a voyage to another land some people you know when for the first time if you're on a ship and you you, you definitely feel seasick i know you've heard of the word being seasick yes now some of these people suffer this and what's the the next action by these white people they chew them down into the sea and there are so many bodies, so many skeletons buried deep under the Atlantic Ocean, according to this poet. And then he went on to say, those that finally arrived, we are marked, we are seared with different marks. Now, if you've watched movies that portrays what Africa went through at this colonial period, I'm sure you understand the mind of Augustinato in the grave lands of Africa. And then he talked about the fact that they were slaves. They worked in plantations with padlocks in their mouth. Some people, they only have to eat in the evenings. And what do they give them? Baked beans, very small, to eat. And then you, they work in sugarcane plantations. I remember my mom telling me stories of she going to a, um, a sugarcane plantation before. And that her body was all itchy. And I'm sure these people who are always naked so that they don't hide anything. I'm sure... They, have, they were very, very itchy as at that time. But there was nothing they could do to save themselves. All they could do was to work for their masters. Even the young ladies were raped in their own room and the masters denying them of their rights. So many things before they decided to fight for freedom. Even after fighting for the end of slavery, then came colonialism. Oh, we want to develop you. And then if you remember, there's a book um, authored by a sociologist that says how Europe underdeveloped Africa. Rather than coming to develop us, they underdeveloped us. They took all that we had and made us feel less human and made us feel like we had no rights when it comes to humanity. And then due to this colonialism, we had to give more than 70% of our earnings back to these same people they brought in education and christianity as a cover while they did so many corrupt things underneath and then he went on to describe the fact that when young men stood up to fight for the rights of africans like themselves they wanted to get their nation back from these colonial masters what happened these colonial masters took them and locked them in jails so many people had dreams of a better country they had dreams of making their country like the other countries they've seen but then what happened to them they had to suffer in jail the likes of nelson mandela the likes of leopold sender sango and then the likes of augustinato who was also the first uh, president in his own nation too now all these people decided to fight for the freedom of africa but then what did they get in return several years of imprisonment 21 years and the likes and then he also described the fact that no matter what they do, that Africa is imperishable and that we will survive despite the fact that we have suffered. And we are still suffering. Of course, we all know Nigeria is still going through that phase. We have not balanced up ourselves. Our governments cannot take care of us properly. There are so many um, graduates out there seeking for job opportunities. There are so many people who have forgotten how to go to the farmlands all because education came to thrive now he said the fact that all this has happened in africa but these white people should understand that africa is imperishable and that africa can never diminish so africa suffered before they became what they are right now and then they are still surviving. If you go to so many countries, you will see the beauty of how far they have come, making Africa one of the most thriving and successful continents in the world. Now, hello students, I trust you've been enjoying the class so far. Please hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. Also, you can like, share, leave a comment. Thank you. Now let's move on. Question three. Examine the theme of the destructive power of rage in the radar of the treasure trove. Have you read the poem? How did the poem speak to you? That poem contains life as a whole. 
It talks about how a human being should live with their fellow man. Yes, it's what English people call social um, polish, so that you can live well with others and don't have issues with them. Now, that poem talked about the fact that we should create happiness for ourselves and for those around us. But then, at the first four lines of the poem, the poet talked about the destructive power of rage. It is very easy for us to get angry. Oh my, what is rage? Rage is a very severe anger, something you can't control. But then, what does anger do? Anger destroys what you built in years within seconds. It doesn't care how far you have come. What you've been doing, I'm sure for those people who don't know how to make baskets, you know the time you spend on it. Building houses, you know the time you spend on it. Now, just imagine there's a, there's a fire outbreak. What happens? Within a night, that house that took maybe the person five, four years to build just gets burned down within a day. That is how destructive rage is. Rage is very, very destructive. It's, it burns you and then makes you to do things that you regret at the end of the day. And then when you've done those things, it then dissipates as if it was never there. And then you are left with nothing but regrets. Now, the poet talked about the fact that, despite the fact that anger comes in the nature of man, we should know how to control that anger. We should know how to keep it in check. Because that is the only way we can live peaceably with others. Imagine a, a, a landlord who has spent so much time building his house. And then all because you're having a fight within the house and then you do something and then fire came out and then you run out. What happens to the old man? You get it. Now, rage is very destructive. It's, it doesn't help at all. So what you do, like I advise those that come to me, once you're angry, please learn to, depending on the nature of your anger, if it's a severe one like rage, do what counts from 100 backwards till you get to one. And I'm sure by that time you would be calm. But remember the fact that what you've built in years can be destroyed in seconds because of rage. Now let's move on to the next question. Discuss the theme of uncontrolled happiness in the poem, a government driver on his retirement. Just imagine. A man who has worked for 35 years for the government. He has been a government driver without an accident, hitch free. And then on the day of his retirement, he drove himself to his own death. Isn't it not ironical? Of course, you would have been wondering that same thing you've been using to control yourself all this while. What happened to it? Now, first of all, the government driver, when he retired, he was given a reward for being a faithful servant. You know, the Bible said, oh, come my faithful servant. I have something for you, Abby. Good. The same thing happened to this driver. He was awarded a car for his years of faithful service. And then he decided to call his friends and family members. I know many of us have attended so many retirement parties, right? To celebrate with him he has spent 35 years in the government now he's going back home to relax and enjoy himself and then what happens he decided to drive yes i now have my own car and then he drove himself with the booze he has had he drove himself to his own death now the uh, the poet described it that after he had taken booze he drove himself with the booze home just imagine someone who has stayed for 35 years, no accident, nothing. On the day of his retirement, he not only had an accident, but died with the very same car he was rewarded with as a commitment for his service all through his years as a driver. Now, the theme of uncontrolled happiness. Many a times, we are so happy that we cannot control ourselves. And then you see these young boys who, who have begun to make money earlier than they should. 
and then they drink and because they are over happy they hype themselves they sit on their cars they zoom and then they kill themselves they have so many accidents out there on the road all because we cannot control our own happiness so the government driver if he had controlled his level of happiness he wouldn't have killed himself now please don't forget the word don't drink and drive is emphasized with this poem let's move on to the next question discuss the poet's change of mood or tone in the poem but have you read the poem it's one of my favorite poems because dh lawrence he went um he was just a good writer that i enjoyed everything in that poem he started the poem as if he was conversing with someone telling the person how he spent his evening and then he started by saying in the evening after you know when you finish eating your food in the evening there are times you just decide to sit outside the house to enjoy yourself so that your food can digest before you go inside and go to bed good now while he was narrating his day to that person an invisible person on the pond he started by praising everything he saw starting from the flowers to the bridge the act bridge to everything the sky the clouds and then he, he saw the sun setting he described it how beautiful it was and then somehow his attention was now diverted to swallows and then the flow, the, the swallows attracted him because they were looping and interlooping among themselves. They were given these beautiful vibes as if they were entertaining him. And then he saw them going down and coming back up through the bridge. And suddenly he saw that this particular set of white birds went down. But what is coming back up is different. It's black. How did white become black? And then he had to pause. And then he said he had to look again. And he realized it is no longer swallows, but bats. And immediately his tone changed. We all have our individual differences. We start first. The moment we see things we like, we show our excitement, our happiness. And then when we see things we don't like, somehow we just lose interest. Why? Because it no longer gives us that excitement we're expecting. Now, D.H. Lawrence, um, he hates bats. He states that the reason he hates the bats is because they hang upside down like rags. And the fact that they make disgusting noises when they sleep and then their mouths are open as if they are grinning. It's, it just makes him feel like, nah, what kind of animal is this? And the fact that they don't even move during the day. That their nocturnal beings even gave him much dislike. And so he went from praise and adoration to disgust. But then when he got to close to the end of the poem, he realized that, oh, the fact that I dislike this does not mean every other person should. He indicated the fact that everyone is entitled to their own opinions. That I don't like this doesn't mean you too shouldn't. Because in China... Bat is a symbol of happiness. And so, the reason his mood changed was because he saw something that he doesn't like, that made him to lose excitement in the beautiful things he was seeing around him. And so his mood had to change. But then he ended the poem by saying, despite the fact that I hate bats, in China is a symbol of happiness for them. But no, not for me. That is the change of mood or tone in the poem. It started with adoration and praise and moved on to disgust. Now let's move on to the next question. Examine irony as a figurative device employed in the poem, Caged Bird. Now before I go ahead to talk about this poem, do you know Maya Angelou? I would like you after this class to pick up your phones research who maya angelo is that woman is one remarkable black american she she gave we the blacks hope when it seems like all was lost her history is a phenomenal one she doesn't know her father 
her mother's boyfriend raped her endlessly. And so many things happened. She had to become a seller, a prostitute, also she could survive. And finally, she became the first black singer, the first black artist, the first black dancer. Is that not a phenomenal woman? Despite all that has happened to her, she made herself something that can be remembered. Now the poem is what she used to describe her childhood. How can you cage a bird? And the caged bird, the wings are still clipped. Allow it to fly inside the cage now. But the bird is not allowed to fly. The bird's wings are clipped inside the cage. And all the bird can do is to sing in a shrill voice. And the free bird who is allowed to fly and enjoy the beautiful sceneries, enjoy food, enjoy every comfort available, is not the one singing. Remember, what is irony in the first place? Irony is usually opposite from the written or said word. Now, these birds... Despite the fact that they are caged and clipped, they still sing. And what kind of song were they singing? Songs of freedom. They did not allow their circumstances to hold them down. I'm sure the greatest people in the world right now, if they are to count five of them, there will be three Africans. Why? They did not allow their color to define them and that is what Maya Angeli was describing in Caged Bird. Hello students, I trust you've been enjoying this class so far. Please hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. Also, you can like, share and leave a comment. Thank you. Let's move on. With reference to the poem, The Journey of the Magi, examine the effect of the journey on the poet personal. Hmm. The journey of the Magi. I know in the Bible we love to read the story of the three wise men, right? Hmm. Now the journey of the Magi is an allusion of the three wise men. Three men just woke up and decided to follow a star because they were seeking for salvation. They were seeking for something that they could hold on to. The journey was not an easy one. They had to leave their own community. They had to leave a land of comfort that they are used to, to sleep under trees in the desert. They were cold the winter during the winter periods. There were times that there were no water. There were times that the three of them had to share an inn because they were lucky to find one. At a point, they started regretting going on that journey. But then, the need to seek for salvation pushed them because they wanted to see that particular thing that can save them. And they moved on till they got there. And when they finally did, they realized it was a journey they shouldn't have even missed in the first place. So yes, the effect of the journey it shows that life in itself, it's a journey from birth to our dying days. And when we live our life well, we will be able to stand in front of God or before God to say, yes, I have lived well. But if we don't, it will be difficult. I know so many times we see TikTok videos of young ladies saying they choose money, they choose um phone and then they want to choose heaven and then somehow it, it seems like they are being flogged back when you want to go on that particular journey called life it is never easy there are times of want there are times when you have in excess there are times you don't even have at all but all this 
is what makes life beautiful. Because while you are in need, someone else has been um, blessed so the person can give to you. And then while you're going, it just shows that life is not a journey you move on your own. You need a companion. That is why we have friends. So that they can guide us. But please be careful the kind of friends you have. I hope that answers the question. Question 8 now. Discuss the theme of death and the poem. Do not go gentle into the good night. Have you read the poem? Just like the journey of the Magi, this poem also discusses life. You see, this life we live is, is a journey. Because... At the end of the day, we have to tell all our stories and we have to go to another world. Then look at the spot. He comes from a different perspective. He addresses night as death. He addresses the fact that some people, they are prepared for the night. But then he advises us that despite the fact that we are prepared for this night, we should not just go down into the night just like that without struggling there's so many people when life presents itself in a bad way to them they just relax i talked about maya angelo who despite the things happening around her still pushed until she became who she wanted to be but if it were some other people they would just end it all some people go as far as committing suicide but well, that is not what you should do. As far as death is inevitable, like we all know, but well, we should not just give in to death. We should fight for our life. Let's fight to build what life has given to us. The poet describes the fact that we know that all this is enough to make us lose hope. And wonder what are we even struggling for? Because at the end of the day, we still have to go six feet under. But then before you go down six feet under, you have to make your moments memorable. You have to create joy and happiness for yourself. You have to treat yourself like you are fighting to survive. Yes, the wise ones are prepared for it. But what about those that are not prepared? Do not just allow situations to define you. Do not allow things that happen to you to define how you behave or how you think. Yes, death might be inevitable. But still, do not go gentle into the good night. Do not give in to death easily. Fight for your life. Fight to make a name for yourself. Fight to be who you wish to be at the end of the day. Now, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell if you've been enjoying this class so far. Also, you can like, share, and leave a comment. Thank you. Let's move on to the next one. Analyze the poet's use of imagery in Disney poplars. Disney poplars. You see, most of us are not familiar with aspens and all these trees mentioned in the poem. But then, I want us to imagine something. Growing up with a particular tree in front of your house. And then you grew up, you went to the university, only for you to come back and you found out that your daddy has cut down the tree. I'm sure you'll be very happy. <laughs> I know you, the first thing you ask, ah, daddy, what happened to this tree now? Why did you cut it down, right? Good. That is exactly how the poet felt when he went back to his childhood community to realize that the trees he walks through in the evenings has been cut down to make railway or railroad. Now, yes, railroad is good. Because it will assess, it will make give easy access to transportation. But then what happens to nature? Nature would be affected. What do we gain? Let me ask our students. 
what do you gain from trees? Huh? What do you breathe in? What do you breathe out? I know some people don't know. Hmm? You breathe in oxygen and you breathe out what? Carbon dioxide, Abby. And that carbon dioxide goes into the trees. While the trees gives us oxygen, we are exchanging. Now imagine these trees that are giving you all this being cut down. What are you left with? That is the angle the poet is coming from. That we are losing all the things that nature has given to us. All because we are looking for a better life. We are looking for comfort. But then comfort that we are seeking for isn't really comfortable. He ended the poem by saying that, though it is good, because he said, end, mend. End and mend, they rhyme. But then they give us two different meanings. It shows that even in good things, evil come out from them. Even in good things. It is good that the railroads are being built. But then what happens to the young boys who wants to go and play? by the stream and enjoy the fresh air. What happens to the old man who wants to sit under the tree? Because the trees are gone. The, the, the way God created nature, or the way nature is built, is such that once something is taken away from it, its balance is shifted. I remember in my primary school, my, my teacher used to tell us, that whatever you take from nature, nature takes back from you. He said, those of us that we go to the river to take sand to build our houses, when rain falls, what happens to those same sand? They crawl back to the river. That whatever you take from nature. But then remember, it is not all the sand that we took from the river that went back to the river. Somehow, nature become affected. So whatever it is that upscales nature, affects its balance and he's fighting for the fact that yes we want good things we want to see beautiful land you see like king um harry that would be crowned i think in a few days uh that would be crowned he's a, a person who, who hates architecture why he said it changes the balance of london because that is not the structure of london in the same way, the poet, too, is of the opinion that you cutting down these trees changes this community. It's no longer what it used to be. It doesn't give me the joy and comfort that it used to. And that is the poet's use of imagery. He had to point out the trees. He had to point out what happened when the trees were taken out. The, the balance that life gives and then the comfort that he gives to us. He painted the picture so clear that somehow it's as if you are in that vicinity, seeing the trees being cut down. And I'm sure definitely you felt bad like I did. And thank you for enjoying this with me. See you next time.